So in this question, we're going to design a lead lag controller for this GC box in our system, which has a settling time of 0.04 seconds, an overshoot of 5% for a step input, and then a steady state error of 0.001 for a unity ramp input. So I'm going to follow through the steps um, that I used in the recap video um, for the lead lag controller. So what that means we need to start with is figuring out where our desired pole locations are, um, given that the criteria that we have to work with. All right, so the criteria we have, we're aiming for a um, settling time of 0 0.04 seconds. We also have a percent overshoot of 5% that we need to get. And the other thing is our steady state error needs to be 0.001, remembering that this is for a ramp um, input. So I'm going to start by looking at my percent overshoot. And from this, I should be able to figure out the damping ratio that I um, require. So natural log of 0.05, that's 5% in decimal form. And then the bottom line is the natural log um, squared of 0 0.05 again and if you type this into your calculator you find out that it needs to be 0 0.69 for the damping ratio. If we then apply our um, settling time equation remembering that this is an approximation equation we should be able to rearrange it for omega n our natural frequency And because we know the settling time that we're aiming for, and we've just figured out zeta, uh, we should be able to get an answer for what the um, natural frequency is. And it comes out to be about 144.9 radians per second. So based on these two quantities, the damping ratio and the natural frequency, we should be able to figure out these desired poles. Oh, poles. <laughs> so the general form of the equation looks like this for a second order system. And if you substitute in omega n as being 144.9, zeta as being 0.69, you end up with your desired poles being at negative 100 plus or minus about 105i. Alright, so our steady state error criteria isn't going to come into it until toward the end. When we design our lag um, part of our uh, controller, um, and that's when we focus on making sure we can meet that steady state error requirement. So, the next step becomes needing to design our lead controller. And for this part of the process, we're focusing on making sure that the root locus um, of our system passes through these desired poles so that we're then able to pick up the value of K um, that will ensure that our closed root response um, is doing what we want it to. So let's write out our open loop transfer function um, based on what our system looks like here. So open loop means that we don't consider the feedback we're just looking at the top line, so it's going to be GC multiplied by this um, block here. Alright, so that's our starting point. Now for the lead controller, that's going to mean that GC takes this form here. So we need to introduce um, a zero and also a pole such that we end up with these desired um, poles sitting on our root locus. Because if you look at our root locus as it stands at the moment, okay, we have a, um, a pole at zero and a pole at negative 20. And this here is the one I've plotted from MATLAB. That's the pole at zero. That's the pole at negative 20. And you can see these root locus lines go nowhere near our desired poles, which were at 
negative 100 um, plus or minus 105. So they're way out over here somewhere. So um, this is where we need to place our zero and our pole such that we get our root locus passing through um, our desired poles. So this step here, it tells us that we can place a zero in a position that minimizes the effect of our dominant closed loop poles. So you have two different choices. One of them is to keep um, the zero as far to the left as possible of the closed loop poles. Because uh, remember, the further something is from the imaginary axis, the less impact it's going to have on your response. The other option you have is to cancel an existing system pole, and that means that you end up with pole zero cancellation, and this is usually the easiest option. So that's the one that I'm going to go with in this example. And we can see that we have a pole at zero and a pole at negative, uh, negative 20. So I'm going to go with cancelling this system pole. So if we draw out what our root locus diagram is going to look like, Okay, we have the pole at zero, the pole at negative 20, and this is not going to be to scale. These two here, the red ones, are our desired poles, and we know that that's at negative 100 plus or minus 105. Okay, so these are the desired ones. All right, so if I'm going to cancel out this pole at negative 20, that means that I'm going to end up with a zero on here. So I've just said my lead um, is going to be uh, 20 in this equation. So that's that one. Now what we need to do is we need to figure out what the corresponding P lead needs to be. So let me draw it just as a value out here. Put an X for it. Okay. This is that negative P lead. And we need to solve for where that is. So I'm going to use the graphical method to work this out. And that means that we pick one of our desired poles. So I'm going to pick this one here. And we need to look at the angles made between each of our poles and zeros and that desired pole. You can equally pick the one down here. You should get the same answer. So you need to measure the angles from the positive uh, real axis and anti-clockwise. So that means that this angle in here, I'm going to call theta 1. I'll call this one theta 2. And I'll call this one theta 3. And we can go through and work them out. So this is the equation that we're filling in here. And the sum of the zero lengths minus the sum of the pole lengths have to be equal to negative 180 in order for our um, position of interest, which is our desired pole here, to be sitting on the root locus. So let's go through and instead of having these in terms of theta z and theta p, we'll put it in terms of theta 1, 2, and 3. So we only have one zero in our system, and that's going to have an angle of theta 2. We've got three poles in our system at theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. And what we're going to find is this pole zero cancellation here. It's going to make our lives a little bit easier because theta 2 minus theta 2 gets cancelled out. In fact, as well, the negatives on both sides here are going to cancel out. So we're just left with this as the equation that we need to satisfy. So let's go through and figure out theta 1 and theta 3. So I can figure out this angle by taking 180 degrees, which is the number of degrees in a uh, straight line, and minusing away this little piece in here. And using my trig, that's going to be inverse tan of the opposite over the adjacent. So the opposite here is 105. The adjacent is 100. And this one works out to 133.63 oops, sorry, degrees. All right, so now we need to also figure out theta 3. And looking at this angle in here, I should be able to just directly apply trig. So it'll be tan inverse of the opposite, which is 105 uh, here, divided by the adjacent, which is going to be the difference between P lead and 100. So there's not much more I can do with that. 
I need to go and sub these back into my equation in order to solve. So taking this away over here, just left with 43.67 is equal to this. If we now take the tan of both sides, we're just going to be left with what's inside the bracket. And then this side gets tanned. If we want to get this P lead on its own, I'm going to take it up to the other side and at the same time bring the tan part down. So P lead is going to be whatever this works out to be, plus 100. And that becomes 200. All right, so if you now went and inspected what your root locus diagram looked like, um, this would be it. So we can see that we still have the original system poles at zero and negative 20. We've then got the one that we introduced, um, in or the zero, sorry, that we introduced in order to get the pole zero cancellation effect. And then this pole over here that we just calculated to be at negative 200. So you can see now that these vertical lines um, for our root locus go through negative 100. So that would suggest that the point negative 100 and then plus or minus 105, which would be actually above these, um, the axis that's shown here, um, it would lie um, on the root locus. So that's a good sign. So now we just need to go through and figure out what value of k that corresponds to. So again, I'm going to go through and use the graphical method for this. So now we need to look at the pole lengths and the zero lengths. So let's call the length of this line here L1. This line is L2 and this one is L3. Uh, and the equation that we need to apply um, if we're using the graphical method is this one here. All right, so LP is the pole length, LZ is the zero length, and this pi isn't actually a pi, it's supposed to be the product symbol, which means we multiply everything together. Just like this is the sum of symbol, so we add everything together. So we have three poles, and they have lengths L1, L2, and L3 that we can pop in. And we only have one zero, which has a length of L2. So again, we can see the pole zero cancellation happening and we're just left with L1 times L3 and we can go through and figure out what both of these are. All right, so let's start with L1. So the length of this line we should be able to get from Pythagoras theorem. It's gonna be the square root of this length, which is 105 um, squared plus this length in here, which is 100 squared. Um, if you type that into a calculator, it comes out to about 145. So now if we go through and do it for L2, running out of space, sorry, L3, that's the other one we need to fill in this equation. All right, so um, L3 is this one here. We now know that P lead is at negative 200. So the length of here is 105. The length in here is 200 minus 100, which is 100. So it's going to be 105 squared plus 100 squared. So it's the same number, 145. So if we go back and put it in here, it's 145 times 145. And this is equal to um, about this, okay? Um, I've carried through a few more significant figures on these numbers. So, so we said that this number here was equal to the overall gain in the equation. So if we go back up, um, we're looking for the constant that's multiplied um, by the whole transfer function on the top line. 
So we can see that in our current form, this is our open transfer function. And at the moment, this is our um, controller transfer function. So we just need to substitute this in for GC and we'll be able to identify the overall gain that we have inside our um, transfer function or system, I guess. All right, so I've copied it down and subbed it in. So now we just need to put in Z lead and P lead as we have identified them. So we just said that our zero was gonna be at 20. And we calculated that our um, lead pole needed to be at 200 a moment ago. So looking at this equation, um, we can see that the overall gain in the system is going to be equal to 5 times k, which was the gain within the controller part. So if we jump back up, all right, k over all here needs to be equal to 5k. So if we isolate just the part associated with the controller, it's going to be 21,004 divided by 5, and this is 4,201. Okay, so this is, needs to be the value of K for our controller um, if we're going to get our poles sitting on the root locus. So if I now go back and revisit uh, the root locus diagram that I had in MATLAB here, um, I'm looking at trying to find my um, pole, remembering that was at about negative 100 plus or minus 105i. And this is about the closest point I can get to it on the current root locus diagram since it's a little bit rough in terms of the sketching. Um, but what we can see is that the gain here, it's um, on the range of about 4,300, um, something like that. And we saw that we calculated that our gain was about 4,200. So since it's not quite on the, on the point that we're interested in, but pretty close, um, I would suggest that MATLAB is agreeing with our manual calculations. So now what we've got is our closed loop pole being able to sit on this point as long as we set k to be equal to 4,200 and we keep our um, z lead at 20 and our p lead at 200. At our transient requirements, um, which was the settling time and the overshoot. So the next step now is to try and meet the steady state error requirement. And this is where we need to come along and design the lag portion of our controller. So now GC, our controller transfer function. It's going to be what we had before. It's a lead lag. Oop, so it needs to be Z lead <laughs> on P lead. But we're adding in the lag component. So that means that we have a lag zero and also a lag pole. Okay, and these are the ones that get designed. So at the moment, we're at the point where we know K, that was the 4,201. We know the lead pole, sorry, lead zero. Don't know the lag zero yet. We know the lead pole to be 200. And we don't know what this um, lag pole is yet. So if we jump back to our um, process, the next thing that we need to do is calculate the steady state error that we want to achieve with the, um, sorry, that we will achieve with just the lead portion of our controller. All right, so what that means is we need to go back now and look at the um, transfer function we had before we put in the lag components. So looking up here, this is what we've simplified it to at this stage. Um, but what we can see is that since we have the pole zero cancellation, um, those two sections are going to go away and we can substitute in k is equal to um, 4,200-ish. So if we do that, our open transfer function with just the lead component simplifies to, sorry, just this here. Now looking at this, we should be able to figure out the system type and then we can use our um, steady state error constants in order to figure out the steady state error. So we can see that we have one S on the bottom line of our equation. That S on its own is like the integrator. And since we have one of them, that means it's a type one system. So remembering that what we're aiming for is a steady state error of this, so a finite value. 
um, for a ramp input. And in fact, it told us it was a Unity ramp input. If we scroll down, I've given us the um, table for working out our steady state errors. So we just said we have a type 1 system. So that corresponds to this row. And we're interested in what's happening for a ramp. So we can see that the intersection is this one here. You can see that this is going to give you a finite value. So that means that definitely um, the steady state error uh, requirement that we have is achievable. We just need to go through and figure out um, what it needs to be. So in order to use this, we need to figure out our error constant kv. And the equation for this is the limit as s goes to 0 of s times g open. Now we have our open transfer function. It's this one here. So I can go ahead and sub that in. And I missed this S on the front from that one there. So S on the top line, S on the bottom line, they're going to cancel out with each other. And then I'm going to set the uh, limit to zero for S. So this one goes away. And we're left with that. And if you type this into a calculator, it comes out to about 105 for KV. So this isn't quite um, the error, all right? This is just the error constant. So what we need to do is, this is for a Unity ramp input, okay? We just need to do one on um, KV. So I'm gonna call this Elite. at 0.0095. So remember that what we were aiming for though, I'm gonna call this E lead lag. It was actually 0.001. So this is a bit bigger than this value here. So the improvement needs to come from um, the lag part of our controller. And if we jump back to our process, um, what we know is that the ratio of the uh, zero lag, yeah. <laughs> what we know is that the ratio of the lag zero to the lag pole is going to be equal to uh, the ratio between the steady state error we have with the lead compared to the steady state error that we have with the lead lag controller. So by applying this equation, we should be able to figure out um, what the values need to be. So let's pop that in. All right, so we know E lead, we know E lead lag. These two here is just the ratio at the moment. So what we're gonna find is that we need to pick one of them um, and then we'll calculate what the other um, would be corresponds to. So I'm gonna nominate to pick P lag and we're gonna pick it to be close to the origin. The reason is um, these are gonna end up being quite small numbers if you pick it close to the origin. And that should um, then end up having pole zero cancellation between these two numbers because they're going to be very small and very close to the origin. So there shouldn't be anything else um, in there to interfere with them and prevent pole zero cancellation from happening. So I'm going to pick um, P lag. And I'm going to pick 0 0.1 for it as a small number close to the origin. So if we substitute all of this into our equation, we're going to find that the zero needs to be at about 0 0.95 in order to achieve our steady state error requirement. So let's go back and write the final version of our um, controller. All right, fill it in up here. So we've now decided on our values. So this one, um, we said needed to be 0 0.95. And we let P lag be 0 0.1. And you can see that these are relatively close. Um, in a moment, we'll check um, to see whether pole zero cancellation actually occurred. But yeah, this is our final value. Um, for our um, controller transfer function of the lead lag variety.
So if you're in an exam, that's pretty much where you need to leave it because um, you don't have any capacity to go and check whether um, what you designed is actually what's going to happen in real life. But since we have access to that, I'm actually going to have a look. All right, so let's check our pole zero cancellation for the lag part of our controller. So this is what the root locus diagram looks like. And hopefully you can see that it hasn't really changed. I mean, we still have our um, pretty much vertical line here at negative 100. Um, and our pole soon, we remember, sat on that line. And if we zoom in, you can see that um, we have that original pole, um, the open loop one at zero. And then we have this pole here that we introduced. This is the lag one. And this one here is the lag zero that we introduced. And they're very close to each other. You can see that um, there is a little bit of a difference here when we zoom into the plot. But on a wider scale, you can't really tell at all that anything changed here. So that's good. That means that we're keeping our transient response, which was the settling time and the percent overshoot. So what the other things we were interested in was whether we actually met our criteria. Remembering that all the way back at the beginning, what we were aiming to do was to design something that had a settling time of this and an overshoot of this for a step um, input. This part here was relevant to the ramp. So if we just go back and assess the step part to begin with, um, this is the response that we end up getting. So you can see that the overshoot that we actually got is slightly higher than what we were aiming for. And the reason for this is going to be the presence of the zeros that we didn't account for um, in our design. So um, I guess this um, settling time equation um, and the overshoot that we have here, um, they're both um, calculated um, under the assumption that we have no zeros in our system. So that was true at the beginning. Okay, we didn't have any zeros at this stage, um, but as we developed our, um, our controller, we did end up introducing them, and that's why we ended up getting a bit higher overshoot than what we were aiming for. The settling time was 0.04 seconds, and what we actually ended up with was, again, slightly different to that, um, although it's very close. Um, this would be partly caused by um, the overshoot not being quite what we expected, um, but also the fact that the settling time equation that we had uh, here is an approximation one, um, so it's going to cause a little bit of error. Otherwise, it's all in all pretty good. So our other um, thing that we were going for was a steady state error of this um, for a ramp input. So this is the ramp input. Um, the red line and the blue line is the response and they're quite close to each other as you would expect since the um, error that we were looking for was quite small but you can see there is a small difference here. So what I've done is I've zoomed in on a segment here um, that I did a moment ago at um, something around 50 seconds and you can see that uh, the difference um, between the input which is like the desired value of our system and the response, which is the blue line. Um, if you take the difference between these, it's about 0.001, which is what we were aiming for. So when you get to time equals infinity, you would expect it to be directly equal to this value. So I would say that we've actually achieved um, that requirement as well. So that's pretty much all there is um, for this video, and see you in another one.